Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. So it's sad that I've spent the past decade uh, planning for something that I messed up so spectacularly within a few years. I made countless mistakes over the past couple of years and put myself in a position that almost irreparably destroyed my possibility of success both professionally and academically. Yay. So I've always known that doing a PhD would be hard, but doing a PhD whilst working basically full time and being 100% financially responsible for myself and my fees whilst living alone with no cohort um, is brutal to say the least. And I found out the hard way that unfortunately, those of us with a tendency to do everything alone and never ask for any help because we've lived our whole lives that way. Uh, I mean, we never got any help in the past so we got used to it and thus had to do everything alone, um, suffer immensely doing a PhD. So on 2nd of January this year, I collated a selection of secondary resources necessary to start my research on Ovid and thought to myself, I know nothing of what these writers are saying. I don't understand what they've written. I'm so out of my depth. I will never read all of these papers in time for the writing deadline in February. And I regret ever starting this. I regret how I started my PhD. I regret how I managed my time and energy the past two years. Um, and I also, I've basically messed everything up. There is no point continuing as I will never recover from this. So I'm going to email my supervisor and tell her that I quit. So that afternoon, I cracked open my email and I did something I'd never done before. I emailed my supervisor and I asked her for help on finding more relevant secondary research papers necessary for me to better understand this selection of my research because I was struggling and I needed help. Yes, for the first time in two and a half years of doing a PhD, I actually emailed my supervisor and asked for help. And I've never actually asked her for anything this entire time, all because I had it in my head that a PhD is something you do alone. And you, if you can't find the resources, you're not a good researcher. And don't you dare show your supervisor that you're struggling and you're so inefficient and inept by asking them for help on such a simple task. And from day one, I told myself that I have to prove to my supervisor I'm good enough. And that the role of my supervisor in my head was one of divine external validation, a mentor that I am supposed to make proud and bother as little as possible. And whilst I do want to make my supervisor proud because I really admire her and she's basically my role model, relegating her to a purely superficial role as the guardian of my academic self-esteem was not only woefully diminishing of her academic prowess and intellect, but is robbing me of the actual PhD experience. You know, I am paying for her guidance, not her approval. And when I was on the edge of quitting my PhD and admitting defeat, I realized that what I needed to quit was my approach, not the PhD itself. So before I go into depth about what I regret about my PhD and how I'm changing my life professionally and academically going forward, I'd like to take a moment to thank today's sponsor, which is Squarespace, for making this possible. So I have built all my main business websites over the past few years on Squarespace. I love blogging about reading and my PhD process and all that jazz. Um, and I love how intuitive Squarespace is, making just website design and layout just so easy and you can just transform everything overnight, it's fantastic because I don't know anything about coding. So website design platforms have really frustrated me and I hated them so much, but with Squarespace, I can just drag and drop my content where I want it. And if you're a creator who wants to expand your revenue stream in the new year, well, Squarespace has an all-in-one platform that makes it easy for you to monetize your content and expertise in a way that fits your brand. You can sell your merchandise on a shop, or there's a members area where you can sell your online digital courses or classes to followers. And Squarespace has an inbuilt email campaign, so you can collect email subscribers and have a newsletter and email them every week. It's really cute. You don't have to change websites. It's all built in. And then you have a built-in analytics feature that gives you insight into who's visiting your website and the traffic sources and the time they spend there and the most read content and geography, just everything you need in one platform. So if you want to expand your business or just build a beautiful blogging website, then go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash lady of the library to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So nothing prepares you for a PhD. You know, my cousin told me that your master's feels like you're being hit by a bullet train, whereas your PhD feels like you're being run over by an extremely heavy, long, slow steam engine. And it just keeps going. It never stops running you over. And everything I knew about academia and how I worked as an academic during my undergraduate and my masters 
is completely inapplicable to how I work as a PhD student. You see, what is expected of you is different, how you write is different, how you read is different, how you think is different, how you function is different, how you relate to others is different, and even the impact academia has on your mental health is different. And as bizarre as it sounds, nothing about the past two degrees prepared me for my PhD. And to say it's a personal learning process is an understatement. You see, when you do an undergraduate and a master's, you feel like your primary objective is to learn and relay your research. But doing a PhD feels like you're building your own academic institution from the inside out from scratch. You're not just reading and learning and writing anymore. You're building a complex structure that transforms your entire lifestyle mentally and the processes that you have in life and your motivations and the rules you live by and your objectives and your own personal code of conduct and the pathways and networks in your brain and the structure. And this is all entirely unique to you as an academic. There isn't a blueprint about how it works and oftentimes others will share their blueprints with you and how they succeed in their PhD and you look and you hear their blueprints and you think they're speaking another language or that they're mad because it's so obscenely alien. It, it doesn't even seem like you're doing the same thing. Even if you're studying the same subject, it seems impossible. It's so unique. So nothing I could have watched or read or experienced would have prepared me for the PhD. And whilst I know I messed up my first year, I have yet to meet a single other soul who hasn't said the exact same thing. I mean, we all mess it up in some way because the process of falling into the PhD is unique. So unique, as it's like your genetic makeup, you know, your fingerprint. And you won't even realise all the possible ways that you can get it wrong until you do so. Now, one important thing that I've learned is that independence does not mean isolation. So PhDs, in the UK at least, I can't speak for elsewhere, um, but in the UK they are primarily solo research projects, unless you're working in like science and there's a lab project and there's more people, but in the humanities it's basically a solo research project. You don't have classes, you don't need to attend any or sit in the exams or have any other little mini papers. You just need to read and write for the entirety of your PhD on one thing, one paper. And as such, some of us make the mistake of believing that we aren't supposed to ask for help during that period of time. Because you're not seeing other people, so you just think, well, it's just me, isn't it? And as someone who studies at a distance from the university, I don't have a cohort or the ability to join societies or meet fellow academics or attend the socials, um, the isolating factor of doing independent research is even more prevalent. Additionally, I don't use social media anymore, so I can't even find other academics in my field and make an online network. And to make matters worse, <laughs> as a shy introvert who has major social anxiety, I didn't actually see the downsides of this until two years into my research. Because I naturally don't have the inclination or desire to socialise, you know, or talk to other people. Because if I'm being completely honest, the idea of making any more friends than what I have brings me so much anxiety and dread. Um, and I fell very easily into the trap of being completely isolated from the entire university, other academics, academia itself really, and any people in my field. And unfortunately, for people like me anyway, academia does require a degree of networking, putting yourself out there, sharing ideas, and most importantly, actually talking to your supervisor more than once every two months. See, I was hoping I could get away with completing my PhD without ever speaking or physically seeing another one, another person, you know. But after attending my first ever in-person conference late last year, I realised that I would probably be better off not going down the complete isolation route. You see, whilst my intense social anxiety makes going to in-person conferences a horrific experience, hearing other academics talk about their research and asking them questions is incredibly beneficial. You know, asking others about their work makes you think differently about your own work, even if their work is not related to your research in the slightest. And I actually enjoyed the act of supporting other academics and complementing their research, even though I am super shy and then got scared and ran away. So what I'm doing differently going forward? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is document my journey. Now, I've been too afraid to document my academic journey out of shame of doing something wrong or catching myself in all my mistakes and publicising that to the world, but by not documenting my journey, I haven't made the experience real to myself or treasured any part of it. 
so I'm currently in the process of discovering a fun and easy way for me to document my research journey without going back to social media platforms like Instagram. So this is a bit of a pain because structurally speaking, uh, Instagram has the perfect format to serve as a digital diary because it allows you to capture unlimited videos and texts and photographs, but also I have no desire to return to Instagram. So at this point, I'm still hunting out alternatives, but I'm currently leaning towards going back to the very basics, which is just blogging on my website and vlogging my process for my Patreon members on a more regular basis, like doing almost like a weekly vlog of my research process. The next thing I'm doing is emailing my supervisor far more regularly. And this is a huge one for me because I also think my supervisor will be very happy to hear that because over the past few years, she's only ever heard from me out of, you know, once every two months on the compulsory basis, because I was too afraid of doing it wrong and embarrassing myself and looking stupid in front of her or annoying her. But her response to the email I sent her the other day was so encouraging and she offered to give me more meetings outside the monthly supervision. So I think I'm going to keep regular contact with her and that will help me with my anxieties about being too stupid or falling behind. The next thing I'm going to do is call myself an academic. So I've never actually allowed myself or others to use the term academic seriously. You know, if anyone in real life called me a researcher or an academic, I shut them down fast. I would just say, I'm just a student. I'm not an academic. I'm not a scholar. It's even that in my description box, I have a disclaimer. And, you know, I, I named one of my social media handles the classical academic because my friend recommended it and she thought it sounded fun. But I was so ashamed <laughs> that I renamed the channel to just Chinsi Dubois and I eventually deleted the social media accounts under that handle out of shame. And I've my primarily refuted the term academic because I don't feel smart enough. And I, I know thousands of people online would say that I wasn't smart enough and they'll criticise me daily for that. And it's always been easier and safer for me to undersell myself and live quite small and quietly to avoid anyone competing with me or criticizing me than live up to my full potential. And I avoided criticism and competition and judgment by just staying out of the limelight, but that came at the cost of my own success and progress. So by telling everyone I was just a student and not an academic, I wasn't just convincing them to leave me alone and, you know, not conceive me as, you know, worth judging or acknowledging. I convinced myself that um, because I didn't believe I was worth anything, I stopped trying. You see, I'm so scared of ever coming across as, you know, egotistical or arrogant or pompous or proud uh, just to avoid any negativity or jealousy or unkind or small minded people's comments. So I'll do anything I can to put myself down and criticize myself first and demean myself and make myself small and undermine anything I've ever accomplished. But at the age of 32, it's time for me to stop dimming my light to protect myself from judgments and competitiveness and jealousy of insecure, nasty, unkind-minded people and ungracious people at that. You know, their words towards me have always said more about their nature than mine. And as someone who has never, and as someone who has never thought that way against others and would never sink to that level in life by bringing other people down, it's about time that I took pride in who I am as a person, both in my nature of being and my accomplishments and not dim my potential just to avoid being noticed by insecure bullies in this world, in all honesty. So yes, those are my biggest regrets from the first year of my PhD. Um, this video is very stressful to film because my dog, the buzzer kept buzzing and the dog kept biting me and then attacking me and it was really painful. <laughs> she doesn't like the buzzer, but I get the punishment and the person at the door gets all the licks and cuddles, don't they? You attack me because the buzzer went off, but it's so unfair. It's so unfair. Yes. But thank you for watching again. Uh, I'm going to be documenting my PhD process here. So if you have any requests for any kind of videos, it'll be down below this little Google form. You can send a request for anything PhD related. Though more vlogging day in my life and just actual updates of my process, I'm going to put over on Patreon. And But I will blog about it over on my, my actual website, which is Squarespace. <laughs> so thank you for watching. I hope you are happy and healthy. Thank you again to my Patreons for making this possible. And I'll see you soon for another video. And remember, Books save lives, so keep reading.